Hi, my name's Claire and I'm a volunteer at the Old Police Sales Museum in Brighton. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the history of women in policing in Sussex and how women campaign to gain their place in the police force. The contents of this talk is based on research carried out for an exhibition on women in policing at the Old Police Sales Museum, which will be open to the public when the museum reopens. This talk has been kindly supported by the National Lottery Community Fund. Women didn't have an easy ride establishing themselves in the police and faced years of discrimination and resistance from many who believed that women were fundamentally unsuited to being police officers. This presentation explores the establishment of women in the police force, starting with the women's groups who paved the way in the late 19th century to pioneering women during World War I and major changes in World War II and ends with the women working for Sussex Police today. The sexism and inequality in the history of the police reflects inequalities in society and historical ideas about a woman's place. And it is important to remember that despite women achieving much in this 100 year period, there are still inequalities in the police and society today. Before I start, I just wanted to make you aware of some minor references to violence and sexual abuse against women. You can stop the presentation at any time. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, groups of mainly middle-class women came together to campaign for more rights for women. These included property and marriage rights, women's suffrage, and the acceptance of women into different professions. One part of these campaigns was the movement to involve women in criminal justice. At the time, police stations and courtrooms were exclusively male spheres. This meant that women were often at a real disadvantage in cases involving things like sexual abuse and violence against women. It was even common for women to be completely removed from courtrooms in cases such as these to protect Edwardian sensibilities. These conditions, as well as the notably harsh conditions for female criminals, especially sex workers, attracted criticism. Campaigns by women's groups stated that women needed to be involved in criminal justice cases which involved women because women were specially equipped to deal with issues of female immorality. Many women's groups in this period used this type of argument to campaign for more rights for women. By arguing that women had special qualities such as empathy and kindness of spirit, Campaigners stated that it was vital that women were accepted into certain arenas previously closed to them, as they could bring something that men could not. These campaigns led to women being appointed as matrons for female criminals and women in courtrooms. In 1917, the first employee, female employee of the Hove Police was employed, and in 1909, the first in Brighton. However, there was still a widespread belief among the majority of the police force and society that women could not become police constables. These matrons had very little power and were mainly there to protect the propriety of women being tried. However, these early campaigns paved the way for more vigorous campaigning for women's involvement in the police later in the 20th century. World War I marked a pivotal turning point in the history of women police officers in Britain. Men were conscripted to fight, leading to a fall in the number of police officers serving. People began to feel less safe in public with less and less police officers patrolling the streets. I'd like to add here that these views mainly came from middle class white men and women. For many in society, today and historically, police on the streets have caused feelings of fear rather than safety. As well as an anxiety over the lack of patrolling officers, there was a growing moral panic about women left behind by their husbands who had gone to fight in the war. Thousands of women entered the workforce, many earning their own wages for the first time, giving them a freedom which many didn't have prior to the war. 
Worries began circulating about the sensibilities and morality of women, about women engaging in what was viewed at the time as unfeminine behaviour, such as smoking and drinking in public and premarital sex, and there were increasing concerns about sex work. In 1914, the Home Office announced a recruitment drive for special constables, which were voluntary police officers, to help with the shortage of police officers during the war. Nina Boyle, an active women's rights and suffrage campaigner, boldly suggested that women should be considered. Echoing campaigns in the late 19th century, Boyle argued that women police officers were vital for the fair and equal treatment of women by police. However, her notion was quickly rejected, with those in power standing firm in the notion that women could not be police officers. Margaret Damer Dawson, a Hove-born philanthropist, also believed that with having women in positions of authority, such as the police, would benefit society and help to protect women. When the call for volunteer police officers was announced, Margaret also offered her services, but was again rejected on the basis of being a woman. Both women were undeterred and Damer and Boyle set about creating a group of women police volunteers in London. Inspired by the women police volunteers, a further group of female police volunteers, the Women Police Central Patrol Committee, was established under the Na National Union of Women Workers. In 1915, the Brighton branch of Women Police Volunteers launched with Mary Hare as its driving force. Mary Hare was an active suffragette who played a pivotal role in inclusion of women in the police. You can learn more about this fascinating history in Colette's talk. Later, a branch of the Women Police Patrol was established in Brighton. And you can see the Women Police Volunteers um, practicing Jiu Jitsu and first aid in Brighton. It is important to add here that this mainly attracted white, middle class, well educated women who would not have needed to work and their activities in the early conception of these organisations were as moral guardians of women and children. The women police volunteers were known to separate couples thought to be embracing too closely and following women they thought may be about to embark on immoral activities. It can be said, as Philippa Levine has pointed out, that the role of these voluntary groups was to protect but also to control women. Therefore, while the police volunteers signalled a turning point of women's acceptance into the police, this history is tied to a history of controlling mainly working class women's behaviour, with the volunteers very much focused on maintaining traditional expectations of women. Despite this, the women's voluntary police groups were a vital groundwork for women's acceptance into the police. After vigorous campaigning from women's groups, and no doubt helped by the success of volunteers, in 1917, Sir William Gentle, Chief Constable of the Brighton Police Force, recommended that the free police, uh, that free police women be appointed as special constables. So, the first free police women in Brighton started at the Brighton Force in 1917. In 1919, the first female officer Gladys Moss was appointed in Worthing, who was also the first policewoman motorcyclist in England. Women had proved during World War I that they were excellent and necessary additions to the police. However, women still had a long way to go until they were properly established in the Sussex Police Force and their ability recognised. As historian and former officer Derek Okinson has explained, the war had established the principle that women might have a role within police forces, but the notion that they could be a regular part of the police establishment was by no means widely accepted. The interwar period marked a number of changes in women's rights in the police. Prior to the war, there had been some doubt whether women were actually legally allowed to be police officers. However, the Sex Disqualification Act, passed in 1919, stated that a person shall not be disqualified by sex or marriage from
from the exercise of any public function or from being appointed to or holding any civil or judicial office or post. This removed any previous doubt about whether women could legally be police officers. Across the 1920s, women police officers began to appear across Sussex. Despite this, there was a very high turnover rate for women police in Brighton, probably due to women leaving the force to get married and have children. By 1920, 1920 there was once again no police women in the Brighton force. Those who had left had not been replaced and there was resistance from the top tiers of the police to recruit more female officers. Financial cuts after the war also limited access to women to the police force in Sussex. Parliament cut the number of women police officers significantly, with one MP arguing that police officers' wives could do police work. Campaigning by Brighton Council members for the rehiring of policewomen was repeatedly rejected, with male officers arguing that there was not enough work for women in the police force now the war was over due to restrictions on the powers women had. There has been a historic undervaluing of typically women's work, such as caring for children, which was relegated to female officers. However, it is important to recognise that this type of work that was often pigeonholed for women was just as important as many of the roles reserved for men and shouldn't be undervalued in this history. Despite these setbacks, in 1923, police women were given the power to arrest on a national scale. However, in 1931, new conditions of service stated that women police officers had to resign if they got married, a tremendous barrier at a time when getting married was a social expectation for most women. It wasn't all bad, and in 1937, police women were authorised to take fingerprints. As you can see, this period was a turbulent time for women in the police force and for those women who aspired to be police officers with significant wins and losses post World War I. Although more women were gradually recruited into the police forces in Sussex, there was slow progress and much resistance. The Second World War was another catalyst for women's entrance and acceptance into the police force in Sussex. Firstly, married women were allowed to rejoin the police during the war. Secondly, due to men again being conscripted to fight, the Home Office established a Women's Auxiliary Police Corps in 1939. Women in the Auxiliary Corps had a restricted range of duties, administration, communications, working in canteens and driving, so didn't need to be enrolled as constables. In 1940 and 1941, Hove and Brighton Police established a Women's Auxiliary Corps. Despite the contribution women were again making to the police force during the war, debates on whether women should be employed in the police on a full-time, permanent basis continued. Arguments continued to fall along the lines that women were not needed in the police. Men could do any job that a female officer could do. Of course, this completely missed the point of campaigns for women to be recruited in large, larger numbers into the police. It wasn't until 1942 that two female constables were recruited in Brighton in full-time permanent positions. In 1943, police forces in Sussex were joined to form a combined Sussex police force, which again sped along the progress of women in the police. Recruitment was no longer down to individual decisions by one chief constable and, and an increasing number of women were recruited. Changes during World War II signified a shift in attitudes towards women police officers. And after the war, the police force continued to open up to women. The marriage bar to joining the police was removed in 1946 and in the 1960s, there was a drive for female police recruits to Sussex Police, explored more in the talk by Wendy, pioneers of the Petticoat Patrol. Across the latter part of the 20th century, women's rights made more progress with the Equal Pay Act in 1970 
and the Sex Discrimination Act in 1975, which helped to target discrimination against women in the workforce. In 1975, women police officers were integrated into the police force in Sussex. Before this, women had been organised in a separate section and dealt mainly with so-called women's work, such as dealing with children and female offenders. After this integration, women were trained in the same areas of police work as men. In 1993, the women prefix was dropped for female officers reflecting changes in attitudes in the 1990s. Despite these changes in progression, women still struggle to be accepted by their male peers, facing everyday sexism and prejudice, a theme again explored more in Wendy's talk. Today, women are a crucial part of the police force and Sussex was recognised in the Times Top 50 Employers for Women in 2020. However, the history behind this achievement was slow and many women fought a hard battle to be accepted into the police. The first female police chief constable was appointed in 1995 in Lancashire, 81 years after Nina Boyle and Margaret Damer Dawson first established the women police volunteers. In the Sussex police force, the first female chief constable and deputy chief constable Joe Shiner and Julia Chapman were not appointed until 2020. It is also important to note that there are many women's voices that are missing from the historical record of women officers in Sussex Police. For example, BAME women and members of the LGBTQI plus community. Due to a lack of sources, we don't have much information on their stories. For more information on those whose voices are often erased in the historical record, Zoe's talk discusses a fascinating history of queer women's suffrage and the police. While obvious sexism in the police force may be less common today due to the efforts of the pioneers I've spoken about here, there are still significant barriers for women. Laws and legislation have changed to include women in the police force but attitudes are harder to change and women still face challenges due to societal ideas about what women should do and who they should be, and the police force is no exception. I interviewed Jackie, former Sussex Police Officer and Deputy Chief of Sussex Police's Gender Equality Network, Evolve. Among many things, we talked about the difficulties women still face today to establish themselves in senior positions in the police force. The continuous lack of opportunities for part-time work means many women often still have to choose between raising a family and progressing in their career. Jackie also talked about the lack of confidence many women have when applying to senior positions. While women are more than capable of excelling in leadership roles, they often feel a lack of confidence when it comes to applying. As Jackie told me, the aim of Evolve is to be a space for women within the organisation to be able to express and talk about issues affecting them, but also to try and promote women in the organisation. Celebrating women's achievements and early career mentoring is also a large part of Evolve to ensure that women starting their careers have the confidence to excel in the police. Evolve are a part of the He for She gender equality movement and work to get all police forces in the UK to pledge commitment to He for She. Jackie and her Evolve colleagues also spoke at a United Nations gender equality conference as part of their work for He for She. The history of women police officers is one of resilience and de determination in the face of adversity. A hundred years of pioneers has led to women being an integrated and enormously important part of the police force. While challenges are still faced by women in the force today, women continue to fight for equal rights and access to leadership roles, shown by the massive achievements of Evolve and other gender equality networks. I'm going to end with some photos of an event in, at Brighton Town Hall in 2017 an exhibition organised by Evolve on 100 years of women in policing. 
It was an opportunity for the police to come together to celebrate the amazing achievements of women. Thank you for listening to this presentation. This presentation has been funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Please keep an eye on our, the Old Police Sales website for news on reopening and the upcoming Women's Policing Exhibition. Thank you.